I'm going to take you over the next um, 45 minutes or so through this idea of talent development, why, what, and how. Okay? Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you a little bit as well to, to make... Am I, in, am I okay to move around the stage? I think I am, right? I'm not getting in the way of anything so far, so you let me know if I need to stop moving. Um, but basically, uh, I'm going to ask you to do a lot of reflection around your ideas around talent development. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna speak, but at times I'm gonna ask you in your tables to do a little bit of reflection and, and, and sharing. Okay, so talent development, why, what, and how. So I've got my own fantasy team, all right, and this uh, this is four of my colleagues uh, that I work with at the university in Leeds, Leeds Beckett University, uh, and a lot of what I'm gonna talk about today has been the the product of of these people's work. So a great bunch of people, really. Uh, Barney, a PhD student, Professor Kevin Thiel, Dr. Fika Rungen, and Professor Joe Baker. Uh, really, really good people, and real, real experts in the topic. The session plan for today. And you can tell that I've been listening over the last 24 hours, okay? Because we're gonna start in the neutral zone, okay? And we're gonna ask ourselves the question, what is talent development? Okay? But then we're gonna be moving to the defending zone, and we're going to look at why is talent development difficult. And we're going to finish in the attacking zone, reimagining talent development environments. Okay? If you tell anyone outside this room that I'm using hockey analogies, I will kill you because the basketball community will disown me completely. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to look at what is talent development, why is talent development difficult, and we're going to reimagine what a talent development environment can be. Uh, and I will be referring to talent development environments as TDEs, okay, because it's a lot shorter. All right, so time for you to, to have a quick chat. Over two minutes, what is talent development? Could you come up with a quick, quick and dirty definition? What is talent development in your tables, okay? Two minutes. We're gonna play some music. When the music dies, that sounds a bit like an uh, American Pie, right? The song. Um, when the music dies, that means that we've reached the two minutes, and then we we um, we come back together. Okay, so you've got two minutes to discuss that question, and I want someone in each table to write down uh, some sort of definition that you agree on, if you can agree on something. All right, go, 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 go. Okay, so hopefully, maybe you came across a definition that is a bit like that. Does that reflect your discussion? Have a read of that. Let's do a, a sort of gladiator test. 
So if that definition kind of resonates with what you were describing, go like this. If it doesn't go like this, and if it's somewhere in between, go like this. Okay, so I'm very great stuff. So let's, let's face the challenge. You guys, you just sent me to, to death, right? So can we get a microphone there and have a chat about what, what, what part of the definition, or what, how, what definition did you come up to? We put down a facilitating growth environment. Okay. So, so you focused on the process? Yes. Perfect. Great. Rather than the identifying or the talent identification. Perfect. So that, that's actually, uh, it's like we planned it, because then the, the second half of the presentation is all going to be focused on the process of growth and development. Okay? So that's perfect. Um, any other comments on that definition from anybody? Anybody else that had something a bit different? No? We're all good? All right. So hang on to that, because uh, and if by the time we finish, we haven't really answered that question, we'll come back to it. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so, next question. Okay, and for this I'm gonna give you a little bit longer. So probably between three and four minutes. Why is talent development difficult? And if the answer to you, if you answer this, it's not difficult, then that's fine, and, the, and that conversation will be over really quick. Uh, but we get, a, we get a feeling that it is a complex process, okay? So what makes talent development difficult or complex. Again, in your groups, have a, have a chat about that. Okay, so um, do, we, do we have any volunteers to highlight maybe one, one issue that you, that you came up with in your, in, your, in your table? Why is talent development difficult? Give us an example of why it's difficult. Anybody? Yeah, can we get the microphone around here? Do you have a microphone? Thank you. Just give us your name, please, if you're the man. Gergely Majoros from Hungary. Um, we thought the, the main difficulty is that everybody and every situation is different. That's the biggest challenge, we think. So every player person and every, every situation person is he's, he or she is in is different. 
And why is that challenging? Why, why does that make the process of talent development challenging? Because we, we thought there's no recipe for you know, f developing talent because everybody's different. There's no magic recipe no. to magic formula. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. And talent comes in different ways. Okay, perfect. Any, any other points? So we've got that one. There, yeah, down there, please. And over here. Yep, there and then down there. Marius <laughs> Gliga, uh, Hungarian Ice Hockey Federation. We thought uh, talent development should be should address individuals, but still, as we talk about ice hockey, it's a team sport. So you have to to, to handle everything and you know use the, that talent in a, in a team sport. Okay, so it's, it's not only so talent development is not just about, just about developing an individual, but it's also about developing them in the context of, exactly. of the team. Okay. Use the skill set in a team sport. And that brings a lot of added difficulties, really, because sometimes uh, I feel sometimes that uh, as coaches, uh, it works both ways. Sometimes we, in a team sport, we forget the individual because we focus too much on the team. And sometimes we can forget the team because we're focusing on the, and the, and the balance is really difficult. And sometimes I feel that in individual sports, it's a little bit easier because you've got to worry mainly about one person. Um, but no, that's, that, that's great. Thank you. Right there. Yeah, Matti from Finland again. Uh, one of the difficulties we talked about was that uh, you've got to get the results also now and which was also at the top yesterday at the panel. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's always the, uh, the, the, the challenge between the long-term outcomes and, and the club or the team manager or whoever is wanting you to win this weekend, okay? And, and, and how incompatible those can be, or may, there might be some ways to make them a bit more compatible, but it's difficult. All right, any, any other challenges? Over here, please. I think it's on already, yeah. Um, Tamara from Australia. Um, this comes from a teaching background as well, but I think that attitude and disposition and the willingness to do the work to develop that talent at individual level is another factor because the player um, may not want to or, or not recognize that, that talent or be willing to do the work to develop that talent. So that's attitude and disposition on the part of the player? Yes. The player understanding the, 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 the hard work that has to go into becoming an, an elite player, yeah? Yes. Perfect. Uh, and, and we're going to talk about that as well. Um, because it is, I mean, if, we, if we're talking about talent development as the process of taking someone to play in the World Championships, okay, that's not for everybody. Okay, that's not something that everybody can do because they might not be prepared to do what it takes. And that's perfectly fine. Um, one of the challenges is recognizing as a coach when someone just doesn't want to be there. Even if we think they have the potential to do it, if they don't want to do it, that's, that's when it becomes a bit, we go into a, a bit of an ethical, ethical dilemma, right? Do I keep pushing or do I just go, well, if that's, it's fine, it's up to you. Uh, great. One more challenge. See if there's any, any, any additional challenges. No. All right, so two of, two of my colleagues there, Joe Baker and, and Kev Till, uh, published a paper three years ago where they reviewed the literature and they came up with a few key challenges that we face when doing talent development, okay? And they're very, very, very uh, relevant to everything you've said. The first one is, actually, do we know what talent is? Can we define it? Do we really understand what talent is? And it is difficult. Is it, is it nature? Is it nurture? Uh, is very dynamic? Is emergent? Is non-linear? Okay, so people look very talented, then they deep, talent development then emer emerges again. It's, it's like, a, it really is a bit of a crystal ball situation, okay, which m accounts for the second problem. How do we effectively identify and develop talent? Okay, let me do, I, I forgot to bring them up, but let me do something. Let me, let me try, uh, I also do um, 
Christmas parties and birthdays and um, what's the word? Yeah, christenings, anything, weddings, divorces, anything, anything, anything ceremonial. Okay, so don't worry, it's not a packet of cigarettes. It's it's, it's cards. But let me let me try this. And if this works, I'm going to be really pleased. If it doesn't work, it's going to be an absolute disaster. But as a coach, you have to take risks, okay? So, could you please join me on the, on the stage? You were on the winning team there, right, weren't you? Yeah, sure. Okay, what was your name again? Arpad from, Ar the, from Hungary. Arpad. Arpi. Arpi, Arpi, Arpi is good. All right, Arpi, we're going to... Um, all right, let me just... Uh, hey, don't look at the cards, man. Sorry, it's going to be a trick for a while. Cheat, yeah. Okay. Happy. We're going to try something, okay? Ooh, why are all... Let me just make sure that the cards are looking the right way up. Okay. This is very elaborate, okay? Okay. Okay, bear with me. Uh, Arpi, have you got any good jokes while I finish this? Jokes? No? Okay, we're good, we're good. Okay. So, let's say, Arpi, that we... We're looking for talent in the, uh, in the cards, okay? And we're looking for the aces. There are four aces, okay? So, RP, pick a card, and please don't, don't, don't pull out an ace. Okay, can you show it to everybody? What is it? It's a four. It's a four, okay? So, we're looking for the ace, for the talented people, okay? So we didn't get it, okay? Let's leave that one there. He's been dropped out from the team, okay? Pick another one. What is it? Seven. All right. No talent, okay? Now we're gonna do it again, but this time you're gonna close your eyes. And I'm gonna turn the cards over, so now we can see, whoa! Man, what's going on? Okay. And now you're gonna you're gonna pick another one. Come on. Okay, show it. King. All right. So I'm sorry you didn't find anybody talented today. You can go back to your table. Thank Bad you. Course, sorry. All right. So I am so glad that worked. It's the first time I tried it. Um, that is some time talent development. Okay, we're trying to find the aces, but we are. We can't really, we don't have the information we need to, to find them. We, we can't see them. Okay? It's hard to identify what talent is, who the real talented players are, because that really emerges over time. When you look at a lot of the selection happening before, before puberty, for example, and it's mostly meaningless, because really children change completely after that. A lot of the selection being sometimes based on Ability at a particular given time, rather than potential. Ability uh, not being a clear determinant of potential performance. So it's like it's like trying to pick the ace out of the uh, out of the deck of cards without seeing the cards. And we're doing that. And, and, and there's another uh, researcher um, that said that uh, it's like trying to find a black cat in a dark room. And I say, yeah, it's like trying to find a dark cat in a black room when there's another thousand cats in the same room as well. Okay? So anyway, that's the challenge. Um, but the, uh, the other thing is that we also have a challenge because, as we were saying before, um, in the comment about the idea of players not wanting to do what's necessary, well, there are reasons for that. Okay? Because... Sometimes talent, talent identification and development systems and environments are not healthy, okay? We think they are, but they might not be, okay? So if you want to know more about these challenges, that's a great paper, the paper that I was talking about. But we have to really understand that talent development is difficult, it's a complex process, it's by no means... Um, a given, and, and it has a lot of uh, complexity around it. So today I'm not going to go so much into those two elements about trying to improve the way we identify, define, identify, and develop talent, but I'm going to focus a lot more 
on the idea of how do we create healthy talent development environments. Because as you know, and if you follow the news, you would have seen this regularly, we've had lots of examples over the last few years of environments that were toxic, of environments that were purely abusive, okay? And we've had those examples from every country in the world, okay? So no one, no one is exempted, no country or sport is free of this. We can do a better job supporting athletes, develop their talent in a more ethical way. So we're going to go into the attacking zone now, reimagining these talent development environments. The main two challenges around talent development and why they might not be healthy, unless we pay attention to them, is those two things. One is the developmental sacrifice. The moment a young person goes into a talent development environment, they're starting to sacrifice other things. We're asking them to spend inordinate amount of time in that environment, which is gonna take them away or not allow them to experience a lot of other things that every young person their age will be experiencing. So there is a developmental sacrifice there, straight away. It could be a social sacrifice, it could be educational, all right? So we have to bear that in mind. But second, we know that talent development can be physically, psychologically, and socially demanding. We're asking people to do extraordinary things, okay? We're asking young people to do extraordinary things that their bodies might not be ready for yet, and that their minds might not be ready for either. So it is, it is a bit of a, it is a really fine balancing act. It's a bit of a time bomb if we don't, if we don't look at it uh, with a little bit of care. So it is, it is not rosy. It's like, I think sometimes we get these, um, and I'm not saying you, but in, like people that don't really work in the talent development space, they feel that first coaching in that environment is easy, and second, that the players are having the time of their life. Okay, when they're going through that environment. But like, like I was saying, we know that that's not always the case. It is the case for some, but it's not always the case. So how do we make sure that that becomes the, um, the case? So again, if you want to read a bit more, a great paper by Fike and Kevin there. All right. But this has become an issue of relevance worldwide for the reasons that I was saying. So much that the International Olympic Committee back in 2015 developed this consensus statement on youth athletic development. And I'm really pleased to say that Jan was one of the authors on this paper, but this paper has been really, really influential um, because that's the way they redefined youth athletic development. And I've highlighted some key words there. Healthy, resilient, sustainable, and enjoyable. Okay, that's what we're aiming for. So overall, in, 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 in our group, we, we think that this points towards what sometimes we refer to as holistic development, which is back to your, your point that you were making earlier about the growth and the development, and not only as an athlete, but as a human being, okay? So holistic development, all right? I'm gonna spend the next 15, 20 minutes trying to articulate what we mean by holistic development and throwing out there some ideas as to how we can create talent development environments that work in a holistic way. So over the last two years, we've been doing a, a research project uh, funded by the Erasmus Plus program uh, around trying to go beyond performance and, and coming up with some guidelines to create holistic talent development environments. We've, we've, working, we've been working with those 10 partners there from different countries. So we've got uh, the Netherlands Olympic Committee, FIBA Europe, the Belgian Football Association, Lithuania Sport University, the Hungarian Coaching Association, the Universidad Europea of Madrid, the Deutsche Sportjugend, the, that's youth sport in Germany, Sport Ireland, my university and the International Council for, for Coaching Excellence. And what we are trying to say there is, look, 
as I said before, sport is not like the uh, the Aladdin's lamp. The moment that we touch, uh, uh, the, the moment that we hold the uh, the hockey stick or we hit the puck, our life becomes better. It's not like that. Sport, and I'm mindful that there are some very young people in the room that might not get this reference. I'm being really ageist there, okay? But a sport really looks a lot more like this, like a game of Tetris, okay? Where the pieces have to fall in the right place for the magic to happen, to happen, for that holistic development to happen, okay? So how do we as coaches play Tetris to get the pieces in the, in the right place? And actually, do we know what the pieces are in the first, in the first place? All right. So, two minutes again, because one of the issues that we found when we were trying to review the literature is that there isn't a clear definition of what we mean by holistic development. So what would you say holistic development is? Could you have a chat in your groups, another couple of minutes? What is holistic development? Go, 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 go. Okay, so um, over to you again. Um, any, any, any table wants to volunteer a, a quick definition of what we think holistic development might be or what the components of holistic development might be? What do we mean by it? Anyone? Oh, thank you. Uh, okay, so physical, social, cognitive, um, affective, spiritual, yeah, so I say physical, cognitive, social, emotional, affective, so generally all those dimensions. Fantastic. Okay, so really covering the whole spectrum of human development. Okay, perfect. Any, any other definitions, any other, any other things that, that you discussed? Does that cover it for everybody? Yeah? Okay. Great, thank you. So, we again, we went back to the literature um, and we found three key areas, okay? Which include the, what, what you were saying there. We found that holistic development is an, an overarching approach, really, to athletic development that aims to develop the young person in three domains, in three areas. So we've got, still we have to recognize we, we're still there to develop athletes to play at the highest level, okay? To develop players at the highest level. So we have to take care of this. And by athletic skills, we mean everything. We mean from the technical and tactical skill to the psychocognitive skills they need to, to play at the highest level, 
to the psychological skills you need to, uh, to, to be able to, as we were saying before, withstand the, the demands of, of doing sport at the elite level. But as well as that, we've got another two outcomes. The idea of health and well-being. Promoting, fostering, and maintaining mental and physical health and well-being. Okay, so we, if we only do this, there's a risk that we're going to only get half the picture right, or a third of the picture right. We have to promote that, because we know that because of the, the conditions of the environment, as we were saying before, it is very possible that young people are going to struggle through this process. And mental and physical well-being are important. But also, remember we said before that because of the commitment we are requiring from these young people and the developmental sacrifice, the lack of sometimes not being able to continue with their education, the lack of social interaction because they have to leave their peer group and move away from home, as we were saying yesterday, Mike, we need to really equip them with life readiness and make the most of the fact that sport provides lots of opportunities to develop skills that you can then transfer to life outside sport. Okay, so our conceptualization of um, holistic development is three ways. Athletic skills, well-being, and life readiness. Okay, so that is a lot to do. Okay, and we want to make it clear, this is not only the job of the coach, okay, or this is not only the job of sport, but we have a responsibility to support these three areas for the young people that we work with. Okay, and I hope you agree with that. Um, and if you don't agree with that, I'm gonna try and convince you, okay? I'm, I'm gonna be quite militant about it. All right, so the first thing is, talent development doesn't happen in a, in a vacuum. It happens in a talent development environment, okay? An environment that it is physical and social, all right, with lots of relationships, that is, contains a network of people and that in that environment there are resources, the, the material resources and human resources, there are policies, okay, how should we be doing things, and there are practices, how do we actually do things, all right? So we have to appreciate that that's where talent development is happening, in these environments. So if we're going to not change anything, but if we're going to, if we're going to optimize something, we need to optimize the whole environment. Okay, not only the practices of the coach. We believe that rather than just putting the job on the coaches, which the coaches have a big job, okay, it's the, the job of everybody. All right, so again, that's a complex picture. So we're back to playing Tetris. First, we need to identify what the, 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 what the, uh, the pieces are so we can then put them in the right place. So through the research that Barney has done, the, my, my, my PhD student, we've identified six, uh, six fundamental principles. And what Barney did, uh, he went into six, what we call exemplary talent development environments. So we went out to a lot of people in the UK to, and we said to them, look, could, could you identify one environment in your sport that you think is an example of how to do holistic talent development. And we gave them the definition of, talent, of, of holistic, right? And we went to six different sports and six different environments. And Barney interviewed um, over 20, I think 25 uh, different people in those environments to try and get an idea of what these people were doing in relation to holistic development. And we came upon six key principles, those six. So these environments, had a real clear philosophy of holistic athlete development. These environments had an incredible level of a stakeholder alignment. Everybody was on the same page. They had set up, and I'm gonna expand on, this, on these six things in a, in a minute, but they had set up a climate of care that was really apparent, okay? They, ha they operated with a long-term development perspective. They were always trying to provide the right level of challenge at the right point. 
and they had really made, made a commitment to integrate life skill development. So let me, let me go through those six one by one and give you some key pointers in each of those. The first one, the idea of embracing a holistic philosophy of athlete development. Unless we adopt that philosophy and make it explicit, it's unlikely to happen. Okay, some of these things happen organically, but if we want to make sure that we are bound by it, we have to make it explicit, so everybody knows that that's what we do. If we go in that way, then we have to redefine success, because we had the example from Cara yesterday, the, uh, the, the difficulty in marrying success as in win or lose, with success as in developing young people in the right way. So these environments that we talked to, they had really redefined success. Yes, they were still competitive and trying to win, and in fact, they were winning, but they have really made a commitment to try and what some people call now winning well. Okay, winning while respecting those three areas, athletic skills, well-being, and life readiness. But also these environments were inclusive and respectful of individuality, which is back to the point that you were making here before, that it's not a cookie-cutter approach that you really take time to understand every young person individually and give them what they need, okay? So that's the first step, really making it really explicit that we have a holistic philosophy. Now, once we've made it really explicit, the second point is, is really important because we could have a lovely, I mean, I'm sure you, um, you might even have this in your clubs, um, but I've gone into lots of uh, high performance environments or talent development environments and you see on the walls these beautiful pictures with quotes of success, blah, blah, blah. Um, I'm not a big fan of pictures on the wall because um, what we want is what we need is actions really, and we need people on the same page. So the idea of if we have a philosophy that is about holistic development, do we really make sure that everybody understands what that means and understands the role they play in it? Because if we just say it, it's not going to happen. Okay, or we are leaving it to chance. And I think one of the things that we, as coaches, back to the scouting session yesterday, we don't want to leave too many things to chance. So this is one of those. that I, I would prefer that we don't leave it to chance. Um, so that means that we get the coaches, the athletes, the parents, and the support staff, all of them have to be aligned and understand. And we talked at length about the parents yesterday, right? But also means that we have to create an interdisciplinary culture that if we are lucky enough that we have a big team of physios, doctors, nutritionists, all of that, they also need to buy into this philosophy and they need to get every athlete individually and they need to work together because they're all coaching the same athlete and we have to stop working in silos where the physio doesn't know anything about what the nutritionist is doing or what they're doing in the strength and conditioning session or what they're doing you know, when they've got the next game. We really have to work to, uh, to get everybody on the same page. Now, point three is around this idea of a climate of care. That really the environment becomes a caring environment that is proactive in supporting and sustaining mental health and physical health. Okay, that we put steps in place, that that becomes a real objective. And therefore, we put resources behind it. For example, um, Manchester United Football Academy, only recently, a few weeks ago, appointed for the first time a, a director of well-being for the Football Academy. Someone that their job is just going to be to make sure that there is a climate of care implemented at Manchester United Football Academy. Now, a big part of this, and sometimes, or a lot of times, overlooked, because we feel that as coaches we have all the answers, is the idea of amplifying the voice of the players. Okay? How do we bring players into the decision making? And how do we allow players, and bear in mind, I'm going to be really, uh, again, really militant about this. This is not optional. Okay, there is something called the Convention of Human Rights and the, the, right, the Convention on the Rights of the Child that says that young people have a right to have a voice. 
and to have their voice listened to and to have their views taken into account. And again, this doesn't mean that we are giving control all the way to the, to the players, because sometimes they, they don't know what they need, okay? But we have a responsibility to listen to them and to work together. It is actually a right of, of, of the child. And, and again, there is increasing evidence that this approach, uh, back to the transformational uh, leadership lecture yesterday, it really creates good results and is very sustainable. So something to, something to think about. Number four, it is important that we work with the long term in, in mind. Um, we've mentioned it before, it is a challenge because people want results now, but we have to find ways to, um, to make it compatible. All right? And if it's not compatible, then always uh, err on the side of long term. Because it is worthless to win an under 14 national championship. It means nothing. 10 years later, but we are obsessed with the idea of winning national championships at, at an early age. And there's very little correlation between winning those championships and becoming an Olympian, for example. In fact, I think in athletics, from the, uh, the, uh, only some, a, a very small figure of junior medalists go on to win a medal at the Olympics, very small. Uh, and that means that we are constantly uh, doing long-term planning and that we have to really work with the athletes on goal setting. And again, back to the idea of giving the athletes a voice, a voice, do we really work together to develop appropriate goals to, to reach the targets that we want? Now, alongside, this is important, okay? Because I don't want you to think that what we're saying is that we are now going to be soft and not really you know, get athletes to do what they need to do. No, it means that we're going to create appropriate levels of challenge that the athletes can meet with the right support. So that equation of challenge and support have to be equal. All right? So because if we challenge people too much beyond their, their current capability, they're going to break. All right? So it's not about being soft. It's about creating the right level of challenge and the right level of support. So people can strive survive and thrive, because young people in, in, in elite sport need to do those three things. They need to learn to survive. Okay, I'm just getting on with this. They need to learn to, um, to strive. I'm just going to try and keep going. And over time, they, they learn to thrive, to, to really do exactly what's needed and, and have the competence to do that. Uh, but that means, obviously, that we have to create that, that level of support. And final point we need to make a commitment to integrate life skill development within our, our talent development environments. Again, back to the idea that, yes, we always say that sport is great and through sport we get things like teamwork and discipline and all of this, but we're leaving it to chance. Sport has great potential to really help young people develop loads of transferable skills. And Jan has done a lot of work in this space. I've done a lot of work in this space. It is, it is irrefutable. It is a great space to develop life skills. So we have to really facilitate that growth and give them opportunities to apply those in practice. How do we help young people to realize that they are picking up skills that they can use in school, in their communities, in the workplace? All right, so we've got about eight minutes left. I'm going to give you three or four minutes to, with those on the screen, have a chat about, it could be, how well are we doing in, in these six areas in your environments? Or which of these six might be the hardest to, um, to implement in your, in your talent development environment if, you, if you're in that space? Just, or, or just critique, praise, whatever you want to do. But five minutes to, to discuss what those six things mean mean to you. Over to you.
Okay. So, um, thank you for that. Sorry to interrupt the conversation. Just mindful of time. Anybody happy to volunteer some of the some of the reflections? What uh, around these six areas? Any any of the tables? Does it look like that in your in your clubs or in your systems? I see some smiles. I'm taking that. It doesn't really look like that in in some places. Come on, talk to me. Talk to me. What's the hardest thing out of that, in the, in your opinion? The hardest thing to do. Go on, yeah. Thank you. We were we were talking about our table that maybe m m the stakeholders all believe that in those values, yep. think they want to espouse or to accomplish those values, and then when it comes time to doing it, they don't do it. Yep. So is the idea of we say one thing but do another? Yes. Which is very common in, in sport. At, so, and, and, and that's, that's the battle. That is the, uh, how do we hold people account? And that's why the idea of making the, uh, the, the philosophy really explicit is so we can hold each other accountable. If we're saying we do, we're going to do one thing, let, let's do it. But it is a massive problem. Any other? Thank you. Yeah, we a couple points. One point is the mental health. Like, how many clubs really concentrate on mental health, the psychology? Like, it's coming more relevant in clubs, but I yeah. still see that we're seeing in kids or even professional players. How are they doing mentally? How are they handling the pressure, the school, the parents? And then that's going into long term. The time for long term planning is hard to convert that. It is. And, and it is something that, again, sometimes we talk about, but we really don't, don't do a lot about. And, and sometimes it's because clubs don't have the resources to, to do it. And I'll give you an example of my own club. We are a relatively, we are a community club with a performance side to it. We don't have a huge amount of resources. So the mental health is something that we are um, we're mindful of. We try to do, but we don't have a specialist in the uh, in the um, in the club to, or, or someone whose job is full time to do that. Okay, um, so we're trying to educate coaches about it so they can spot signs. But it is it is difficult. Um, but it is it is so. I mean, the the other thing about mental well being is that in the past. Um, we, we've kind of tended to think about mental well-being and personal development as, well, we have to do it because better people make better athletes, as in it's beneficial to performance. No, no, we have to do it because we have to do it, not because it's going to lead to better to better performance, which we it will, but it's not it's not a transactional thing. It's not like we're doing it because we want to we want to use the athletes. No, it's, it's, it, again, it's a right of the uh, the young person. So let me just finish with. Um, giving you some info. If you want to find out more about some of these things, we, as part of the project, we developed a, a, a website. It's called iCoachKids.org. Okay? And we've got over 300 uh, resources there on all things coaching young people, from talent development to motivation to you know, child development to, to anything, to pedagogy. Um, so please, iCoachKids.org, have a look at it. And if you want to go even deeper, Within the website, we have uh, five free e-learning courses. Everything is free on the website, OK? Um, free e-learning courses. So for example, we just got one out now. This course number five is about developing effective talent development environments. So everything we talked about today, we expand a lot on, on, on that, on that um, e-learning course. Um, and, and you can, if you go on the QR code, you can access that this morning, if you want to, OK? Um, yeah, and I think that's it. So I'm taking a leave from uh, Mike's book, and I'm going to thank you from Manchester as well. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so I'm mindful of time, and we've had already like a, a bit of a Q&A. So we're going to break for coffee, OK? And I'm going to be around for coffee if you want to 
ask me anything about this area, by all means, come and grab me. And I will see you in 15 minutes for our second presentation this morning. Thank you.